Okay, chapter 13 is consumer law. What do you think about when you hear the term consumer law based on what you read in the textbook? How would you summarize consumer law? Why does it exist? <laughs> Say that again? Okay, to protect the consumer, exactly. Some other things we're going to talk about in this ch chapter is advertising and marketing and sales laws, right? Uh, labeling and packaging, protection of health and safety, and credit protection, right? Um, those are all areas that, that um, the um, law is concerned with to, to protect consumers. So let's talk about advertising, marketing, and sales. So there's something called deceptive advertising and laws against it, right? It's deceptive advertising is advertising that is misleading consumers. Can somebody give me an example of a de deceptive, what a deceptive advertising may claim or may state that is misleading? Yes. This is one from when I was uh, smaller. Uh huh. We used to go to the dollar store a lot. And I saw this like mini dinosaur and on the packaging and said, put it in water and it grows. Good time, good time. Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> like maybe a little bit, yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. So a dinosaur, the packaging, a, a toy dinosaur, the packaging claimed if you put it in water, it'll grow 600 times its size. So it's probably this big. It would be something like this, right? But it did not. Yeah, that's that's definitely what you said. They advertised something wrong, right? Yeah, definitely. So basically misleading consumers, trying to get them to buy something and then they don't don't receive what they thought they were buying, right? Uh, claims that appear to be based on factual evidence. Uh, so factual evidence, what is factual evidence? So let's say there's an ad uh, about um, toothpaste and it says the, the tooth, 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 and this you will hear this, you probably heard this before, nine dentists out of 10 recommend this toothpaste. What does that mean? Nine out of ten. They have pets. You should have pets and So what do we assume? What do we think about when we hear that? Pretty good, like ninety percent. That's very high, right? Ninety percent. But what else do we know about that statement? That's it. Maybe they only ask ten dentists. That's right. Maybe they only need to ask ten people. And nine of them could be working for that company. And they will, and one of them doesn't, right? So we have to take those kind of statements with a grain of salt, right? So we hear those things, right? I think it is still kind of misleading, but it's not fact. But if there was an empirical study done and 90% of a certain group of people will recommend this one versus a different one, then that would be a factual statement, right? Then they could say, according to the study, and then you could look up the study and see they ask a million dentists, maybe. And then it becomes more significant, right? Then it's a, 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 it's on factual evidence, right? Uh, sometimes claims are based on half-truths. It's kind of like what I said. Yeah, sure, nine out of these 10 people said that, right? Uh, and then there's bait-and-switch advertising. What is bait-and-switch advertising? I think I have slides on Check me. Oh. Yeah, I do. But quickly, in your own words, yeah, uh, yes. It's when you like advertise a product for a super, super low price, the consumer comes with a product, and then you just say you're out of stock and push them to buy a different product. Yes. Who does that a lot? What type of companies? Car car sales. All the time. All the time. Uh, now, uh, they usually put in the ad now, because uh, there were lawsuits, in the past, they put only one available at this price. And by the time you get there, it's gone, right? Yeah. So um, anyway, so let's let's look at some examples here. So here's an example, Palm Wonderful versus Federal Trade Commission. Uh, so Palm argued that, oh, OK, so, you know, Palm, there was something about vitamin C, right? Um, uh, that we all know vitamin C is good for us, right? Uh, and Palm was selling, I think, cranberry juice. Does it say what kind of juice it was? Pomegranate juice. What's this? Pomegranate, of course. Why would it be cranberry juice, right? <laughs> it's uh, pomegranate juice, which contains a lot of vitamin C, and they made claims about vitamin C, uh, uh, you know, 
does protect you from or give you some kind of health benefits, right? Um, and, but but they weren't allowed to claim that anymore because there was no um, empirical evidence or not no uh, no factual evidence, I should say, right? Uh, but they said we can't really do a study where we deprive a huge amount of people of vitamin C for long periods in their lives, let's say 10 years, they don't take vitamin C and then compare it with a group of people that does take vitamin C because we need vitamin C to live. We can't deprive ourselves from it. It would be unethical to do a study like that, right? That's what they argue, right? Uh, it's ethically deprived a control group of patients of vitamin C for decades to determine that whether vitamin C helps prevent cancer. They can't really do that stuff. Is this a valid argument? Why or why not? What do you think? Diego. I mean, I think it's true, but like, doesn't mean that you can claim it. Like, it, like yeah, that's unethical, but again, then we don't have evidence. You don't have evidence, and, and then no you shouldn't be able evidence. to claim it without evidence, like right? None yeah. of your competitors can claim the same. There are empir like empirical uh, data and studies and things like that. The vitamin C uh, proves to be good for your immune system and yeah. proves to like benefit, like I think, uh, <laughs> like longevity of life and things like that. But like, it's not answer like without can, a fact you can claim other things you can claim other things but without the factual as evidence you shouldn't be able to claim it right yeah anyway bait and switch advertising is when you somebody comes to the store and they don't have enough products or they don't show the product or they encourage salespeople to upsell other products like car salespeople do all the time right you go in because there was something advertised and even if they have it oh that's that's really not a good one i want to show you this one which is about ten thousand dollars more right um, online deceptive advertising. All advertisements must be both on, for both online and offline must be truthful and not mis misleading, of course, right? The claims made in an ad must be substantiated, so they can't be made up. They, you have to substantiate the claims through studies and so forth. Ads must disclose relevant limitations and qualifying information underlying the claims, right? So it has to be available if you want to look at uh, what they use, right? They have to disclose that information. And uh, required disclosures must be clear and conspicuous. How do you pronounce that word? Conspicuous. Hmm? Conspicuous. Conspicuous, thank you. I was going to say conspicuous. Conspicuous, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, funny, my um, morning class, Intro to Business class, um, we talked about... Um, um, branding and product advertising and things like that, not from a legal perspective, but from a marketing perspective. And the, the um, uh, a student brought up, uh, an international student brought up the fact that we have all these uh, drug commercials, prescription drug commercials on TV with these long disclaimers, you know? It helps you with this little condition, but you can do, it causes this and this and this and this and this and even death. Right. Yeah. So that's that's uh, part of it. Why why the disclaimers are there is because um, um, they have to notify people of side effects and, and obvious and clear and conspic conspicuous. Yes. All right. Um, the Federal Trade Commission's actions that they will take if there uh, you know if there's a formal com complaint, the FTC uh, they can do two things seize or desist order or counter advertising order so they can tell them well first of all you have to stop this right now whatever you're advertising you have to pull this right now and sometimes they will also require you to do a counter ad correcting yourself saying we advertise this it was wrong it's actually this right so they can um uh, order that right damages when consumers are injured um, I don't know what, the, I don't remember the damages. I know the case, there was something about a Chinese diet tea that claimed if you drink this diet tea, you're going to lose weight. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a lawsuit, but I don't remember what the remedy was for this. Does anybody remember from the textbook? 
It's uh, case 13.3. A lot of times you all get money back from the purchases you made, right? Or a certain amount. But I don't know what the what what the uh, they gave for damages here. You all have to read the chapters before class, including the cases. So I know there are a lot of them. Sometimes we don't remember them, but I left this on the slide because it was significant. Anybody that has a result, just read it to me from what you found. So it just says it's 91% absorbed sugar and prevents any um, fat absorption. But what is the remedy? What does, I wonder, does, does the book state what they received, what the consum injured consumers re received in return? Uh, 1942000 Close to $2 million distributed to in, 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 in damages, so monetary damages, right? All right. Um, <clears throat> astroturfing. Has, have you heard the term of astroturfing? Yeah, what is it? Besides reading the slide, right? <laughs> It's really writing fake reviews, right? Going there and, and you're selling a product and you keep reviewing it <clears throat> yourself, right? Um, that's uh, called astroturfing, right? Uh, there are regulations of fake reviews. So, um, you know, a lot of times you, uh, consumers get an incentive to review a product. They'll give you a free product. If you write us a review, you will receive this product for free. Or we'll give you said send you a second one for free. Has that ever happened to you on Amazon? I have had that happen where they said if you write us a good, good review, we'll send you something, gift card or something like that, right? Or uh, for uh, you know another of these products or you know. Um, so um, the rule is the poster must disclose relationship to the producer or company, whether you work there or or whether you're. <clears throat> you know, investor or whatever, you, you have to disclose that, right? And the poster must disclose if three products were received for the review, right? So um, they have um, uh, that, because why, why do you think we have that law? How does that protect consumers? Companies will usually close their mouths. Like there are some companies called kind of agents. So <laughs> they, um, they collect um, influencers, so they send the product to influencers if they are getting the product for free or they are paying there for review the product. Of course, if you're getting paid, you're getting the product for free. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're uh, you get to because you're saying to say that it's good because you know, so you you're getting it for like influencers, it's very common for influencers, right? They receive pretty much everything for free. They're influencers that live by not buying anything, by barely buying clothes or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, but they, they have to um, um, disclose that information. Because me as a consumer, but now I'm not going to take that review very seriously because I know they're just writing a good review because they got something for free. I'd rather know the reviews of people that really just wrote the review because of their experience with the product regard and they have no stake in the company, right? Oh. If we have time, we're going to watch this. This is um, related to data, data privacy and what Cambridge Analytica found out, what Facebook and other social media companies were doing and how it even affected the election. We will watch this um, after the slides if we have time. Uh, marketing. Uh, telephone solicitation. I still can't believe I still get phone calls on my cell phone. People trying to sell stuff. I don't know who buys stuff like that, but I still get that. So um, there are fines up to 11,000 a day or 
Oh, fines up to 11,000 a day. That's a lot of money. And uh, 500 uh, to pay to the consumer for each occurrence. If you uh, tell them to remove your phone number and not to call you again, or you put yourself on the do not call list and stuff like that, they still, yeah, yeah, you still get calls. Does none of that works yet. Uh, now, a lot of times, your phone company will identify that it's a spam call, right? And they will let you know, it'll tell, does it say? Spam. Spam, spam. spam it does say spam. spam yeah, like yeah, so. Um, telemarketing sales rule, identify yourself and your product, speak truthful and remove people from the call list if they request to be removed. Um, sales. Uh, so there's something called cooling off loss. So when you buy a product, you usually have 72 hour cooling off period where you can change your mind, right? Uh, so a law that allows a buyer of goods sold in certain transactions to cancel their contract within three business days. This applies to trade show sales contracts, home equity loans, internet purchase contracts and door to door sales contracts. So this is where you kind of are maybe pressured a little bit or you go to a trade show and there's a lot of hype and everything is so exciting and you get all this energy from everybody and you got the greatest sales pe people at the booth and they sign you up for some kind of long-term contract and then you go home and then the next day you wake up, oh gosh, what did I do, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, by the way, when if you get married in Vegas, I think you have something like cool, something like a cooling off period too, right? <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, so, um, uh, of course, it doesn't apply to when you go buy a car. And a lot of times the car dealership, when you sign the contract, has a sign or you've signed something. There's no cooling off period, right? Because the moment you drive it off the lot, the car loses value. New cars especially, right? Um, so the Federal Trade Commission's mail or telephone order merchandise rule so if you buy something and it doesn't tell you when they ship the product, it must be shipped either, well, if, if, if it's as promised, you have to ship it as promised. If it says sh we'll ship within 24 hours, they better ship it within 24 hours. Or if there's no time quoted, they have to ship it within 30 days, right? Because if they ship it a year later, you might not need that product anymore. Forget about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you forget about it, right? Uh, canceled contracts must be refunded, right? In that case, you know, if you, they didn't ship it within 24 hours, you cancel it, they have to refund it. You know, sometimes I order something on Amazon and it doesn't come within the, I have Amazon Prime within the two day period or the time that they say it will come. And, and sometimes it was things I needed that day or I was going on vacation and I needed it to be whatever it might be. And then I, 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 I um, basically, canceled it or returned it, never had a problem with that, right? But they have to do that because they promise to ship it within a certain period of time, right? Uh, labeling and packaging, fuel economy labels on automobiles, uh, how many miles per gallon can you get on a car, right? Um, so it's a very important factor nowadays with high gas prices when we buy a car. How many miles can I get with a gallon, right? Um, so, um, there was a case, uh, Paduano versus American Honda Motor Company. Um, can you all close your laptops, please, and put your phones away? So, pay attention to the, the, the lecture, right? Everybody close your laptops, please. Can you close your laptop? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, it's an important case. So, what happened here is, um, Honda claimed, and I don't remember what the mileage was, that they can get something like 45 miles per gallon. 39, I don't remember the exact number, right? And somebody bought the car and did not get that mileage and sued, you know, because, you know, people do look at that. And that is an, an, a, a different, differentiating factor in marketing when you have higher um, or lower gas usage, I, I should say, right, per mile. So um, Honda said, oh, well, yes, of course you can get this mileage. You just have to drive 30 miles per hour without stopping and without accelerating and without slowing down. It is possible to get that mileage. What do you think courts decided?
get some people that don't participate much back here. What do you think courts decide, or what would you decide? This side of the room. Again. Yes, so um, uh, so Honda said you can get 39 miles or whatever the mileage was uh, per gallon if you drive this car 30 miles an hour continuously for the entire tank without accelerating it, without slowing down. You can get this mileage. But the plaintiff said, I can't get this mileage because I'm driving in normal traffic in, in the city. I'm not driving 30 miles per hour until the tank is empty. What, did, what do you think the courts decided? Do, do, do you think, would you decide Honda is wrong, they shouldn't say that? Or would you decide, well, technically it's possible? I think it's possible in certain circumstances, but I don't think it's right for them to decide that because there is underlying factors such as like traffic and other Nobody is really going to drive the car at just 30 miles an hour without stopping, right? If you go out of town, you're going to drive faster, first of all, right? Yeah, it's not reasonable. Yeah, yeah. so so they lose lose the case, right? Uh, Based on deception as well. What's that? Deceptive. Deceptive advertising. Yeah, it was deceptive advertising, or the, the label was wrong. You know, when you buy a car in a car lot, it has that label that has all the, the requirements on it, right? Uh, not requirements, the, the specifications of the car. Yeah. Um, food labeling, controlled by the Food and Drug Administration. Nutritional content has to be uh, on packaged goods, processed food. You're not going to have a nutritional label if you buy a bag of, if you buy apples at the farmer's market. Not necessary, but when it's processed food or packaged, you have to pro provide that, right? It had a, a how about restaurants? Do they have to provide caloric content? How many calories food has? Yes. They do if they have uh, five or more locations. Uh, individually, family-owned restaurant would I would put a little too much burden on it for them to figure that out and publish it, and they might change menus and things like that. Right. So. Um, EU bans ingredients on consumer products that, by the way, the U.S. does not ban food, ingredients, right? Can you think of any that might be banned in the EU that are allowed here? There's a coloring product called Red 40 that's banned in the EU. I think they still use it here. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think the EU bans products that we are allowing here? Yes, Eleanor. Maybe they might have health conditions for people that they just want to get rid of. And then here in the US, it was like, don't tend to really notice that as much because I know like with American food it's very different than European food. Very yeah. different. So like and Americans don't tend to really think about what they eat. Like what they're like, oh fast food, let's just go get it. And they don't really think about what's going in them. But like, you know, Europeans are much more like conservative with the health conscious. Exactly. Yeah, and, and, and healthier in general because of that. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um yes. Um I don't know, but I think it's sometimes because of maybe the ethical part of it and like how some countries in like Europe are more adventurous with like their their meats and stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that would have anything to do because I know that some things that they eat over there is not allowed like over here. Uh, I know that foie gras wasn't oh like a thing over here for a while. Yes. And then oh, it the became... foie gras is horrible. Yeah, yeah. That's a different. Yeah, that's a different topic. So this is not an ingredient. Yeah, this is actually. Something that's not allowed here, at least in California, black well, is no longer allowed, right? Okay. From what I know, right? Uh, yeah. I think that they changed it a little while ago, but I don't remember. Yeah, do you guys know what foie gras is? Yeah, it's it's a uh, uh, goose goose liver, right? And they force feed the goose with a funnel, literally, until the liver explodes, and that's when they take the liver, and it's disgusting. I mean, I don't, I, I never ate it, but even the smell of it is disgusting, right? It's like a lot. But, but that's the opposite way, right? That's something, uh, you know, uh, but I'm not sure if it's illegal in the United States, but I think California has stricter laws about that, right? Yes, Diego? So most of the EU countries uh, are on universal health care systems, and if their citizens have more underlying conditions because of the food that they're eating, 
it's going to cost our government more. That's right. The governor actually has a very good answer. The governor has a stake in keeping the population healthy, right? And the United States healthcare is, is commercialized, right? And and those companies and and also food companies, by the way, they have lobbies and they petition for certain things, right? So uh, different systems, right? Um, sorry. Yes. Not only it's um, commercialized, but also we don't have America don't have like. Uh, public health system, so they don't have to pay. In the UA, they do offer health care, the public health care, so it is kind of a damage prevention, you know? I, it could go weak, you go get sick, and then I don't have to pay, so it's a... Uh, yeah, it doesn't work very well. Yeah, We don't have a public health care system, like most European countries have, right? Or or semi semi semi-public, if, if, if it's not fully public, I mean semi. Uh, government owned, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, more on uh, protection of health and safety, food and drug, drugs, tainted foods. When can foods be tainted? It depends on, on you know, the packaging, the handling, the length, the expiration dates, and, and, and you know, food handling in restaurants. To, food can be tainted, right? Uh, drugs and medicine, medical devices are controlled and uh, testing and medical trials you know things have to be tested over sometimes a decade before they can release a new drug they have to have medical trials to look at the effectiveness the side effects and all that stuff we made an exception with the COVID vaccine there was an emergency authorization typically that vaccine would have had to be tested for years before it could be released Thank God we got that emergency authorization, right? So, um, consumer product safety. So the CPSC authority, right? Set safety standards for consumer products. So they ban manufacture and sell of any product that the commission believes poses an unreasonable risk to consumers. So unreasonable risk. Of course, a knife has a risk. A short blade has a risk. Of course, a car has a risk and all that stuff, but that's not unreasonable risk. If you use it as intended, you shouldn't be getting hurt, right? But if there's a knife that's not properly attached to the handle and when you cut something hard, the, knife, the, the, the blade blows off and you know hits your face or something like that as a result, like electric knives, for example. You know, they're electric knives that you can cut really nicely. But uh, you know, that those, those products would be illegal to exist, right? Uh, they remove from the market any product it believes hazardous. Uh, frequent, uh, they, they frequently work with manufacturers to voluntarily recall defective products from stores or from, from consumers. Diego, you have a comment? Yeah, how did Elon Musk's, uh, Elon Musk's like commercial flamethrower make it on the market? Which one? He, he sold a commercial flamethrower uh, like in 2019. What was that? Uh, it was from the board company. Uh, like he sold like five hundred thousand units of like. What is it? It's a flamethrower. Like you throw a flame? No, like a like oh, trigger yeah. kind of like spits out flame kind of flamethrower. For what? For fun, I guess. He'd like <laughs> I don't know. He didn't. It, it didn't have a purpose. He just wanted to make a flamethrower and sell it. Um, huh. Well, you know what? Uh, it's like if you use it as intended, it's not going to hurt anybody. Guns can be very dangerous and hurt people and kill people, yet we can still sell guns. So a flamethrower is probably next to nothing when compared to a gun, what the damage it can cause, right? Yeah. So uh, again, unreasonably dangerous, right? You have lighters. It's 20,000. Hmm? There's only 20,000 sold. 20,000 sold, yeah. Uh, does that answer your question? It's it's it's, it's an, use it as intended. There are lots of dangerous products that we use, that that are sold, but you know you they're not unreasonably dangerous, right? And they don't necessarily have to have a purpose, right? Or the the uh, you know, I mean, I guess everything has a purpose in a way, right? But think of fireworks. What's the purpose? Well, you see the fireworks. I guess that's the purpose. You go ooh and ah, right? Yeah. Um, 
so anyway, so recalls also very often happen with cars. They put cars on the market that they later realize there's something not, not properly uh, designed or whatever, and then you uh, you know everybody that owns one of those cars, cars gets a notice saying bring your car and there's a recall and they'll fix it for free. Right. Um, requires manufacturers to report any products already sold or intended for sale that have proved to be hazardous. So um, you know if you. Uh, realize it after you sell a product or you're just starting to sell it, you have to let them know as well. So then you can remove it from the market, right? Administers other product, say, any other uh, product safety legislation. There's a notification requirement. Distributors must notify this authority of any defective products that create risks to consumers. So um, um, if products are defective, they have to notify if they find out. Right. Uh, the next topic is credit protection. The Lending Act, uh, so it, it, it deals with how applications are handled with and, and disclosures about the loan that you are about to get yourself into, such as interest rates, fees, and, 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 and so forth, prepayment penalties. Very, very important. If you ever get a loan, ask if there are prepayment penalties. Because some loans might have prepayment penalties that you cannot pay off early to avoid the interest. They used to be more common years ago. I don't see many of those anymore. Right. But you know, they want you to keep the loan a certain amount of time so they can get money from the interest. Right. So, and if you don't keep it that time, you have to pay a penalty to pay it off early. <coughs> um, equal credit opportunity, uh, so there was somebody of an, um, contract bank versus huge, personal guarantee contract was in person. So uh, I don't remember the details of the case, but this has to do with, um, you know, uh, somebody who applies for a loan, the, they have to be subject to the same checks, background checks, requirements, co-signing or whatever, regardless of their gender, uh, 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 race and so forth, right? So everybody should have the equal opportunity to receive credit. So if somebody who is of a certain race uh, or gender is required to provide a uh, co-signer versus somebody who is not of that same minority, that would be uh, not, um, that, that would violate the Fair Credit Lending Act, right? Um, credit card rules. If somebody gets hold of your credit card or your credit card number and illegally uses it, in this country, as the credit card holder, you are only um, responsible for up to $50 of whatever that other person may have charged on your credit card. Yes. Yeah. So they're really putting the burden on the uh, on the merchant to verify that it's a uh, not a stolen card or not a legally used card, right? Yeah, that's why they do verify your identity, or they want your zip code, your expiration date, or this or that. And then when the amount is bigger, sometimes they don't approve it until your credit card contacts you, and the credit card sends you a text and says. Uh, we got this for this purchase. Are you authorizing it or not? And then you say yes or no, right? So, um, uh, yeah. So, uh, but you um, you are not um, required to pay more than fifty dollars for unauthorized use. Right? Remember that. Uh, the way bills are uh, calculated. You know, sometimes credit cards have. Um, different interest rates for different like for cash advance is a different thing or for for purchases it's different or maybe you have like a special where you signed up the first 12 months or zero percent interest and and, all, and so forth so the, the the rule is the way they the 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 interest is chart or the the payments that you make always go towards the highest interest balance right that's that's the rule right and then late fees, how late fees are charged and calculated. And, and, and you have to, they have to send you the bill and you have to have, I think, 21 days to pay it or something like that, right? So, um, and then there's also a rule of, that's usually the, the highest interest rate they can charge on, regardless, right? 
All right, that's it for this chapter. Let me stop the recording and we will watch the video. We have a little bit of time. I think I'm talking about people stealing credits and so I want to check my credit.